Mike Hatfield, Flyway Family Farms. He's going to give our first presentation on raising mushrooms for fun and profit. All right. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, thanks, everybody, for having me today. Um, just before I get started, if you have any specific questions or any come up kind of while I'm talking, feel free to throw them up in the chat uh, and we'll try to get to them. Figured I'd give a little overview of kind of what we do on our farm, how we got here, and kind of some of the general basics of cultivating mushrooms on logs. Um, and then we'll kind of just open things up for discussion. Usually um, folks like yourselves have a lot more questions and, and can drive these kind of conversations better than, than me just kind of uh, lecturing to you about things. Uh, but anyways, our farm is Flyway Family Farm. We're in Southern Illinois uh, in rural Macanda. Uh, we've been growing mushrooms, primarily gourmet mushrooms. So things like shiitakes, oyster mushrooms, lion's mane, chestnut, piopino, uh, mayatake, things like that. Uh, just about everything except your typical, typical button mushroom. We've been doing that for um, full time for about 10 years now. Uh, started as a hobby about 15 years ago. Um, at this point right now we grow pretty much everything indoors and we grow on sterilized hardwood sawdust substrates. Um, where we're at with production that allows us a lot more controlled growth. Uh, we do it indoors under controlled environments um, but that's not how we started. Uh, the first mushrooms we grew were mostly shiitake mushrooms on hardwood logs uh, that we cut out of, out of our woods. Um, and before that on uh, logs that just, I got from local folks, uh, local landowners. Um, when we first started, we moved on to the farm. We have about a 10 acre farm and it's about a third of it, three or four acres are wooded. Um, I initially got my degree in forestry at SIU. And at the time I was uh, in graduate school um, and had a passion for mushrooms. It was kind of just a hobby. Uh, but what we were doing was doing some timber stand improvement type cuttings in our woods. So most of what I was growing mushrooms on was thinnings of mostly sugar maple, a little bit of oak um, and a little bit of black cherry, but that's what we had in our woods. And that's what I was trying to thin up some smaller diameter, diameter ones to open things up for our, our oaks and our, some of our bigger maples. Um, a lot of mushrooms can be grown on our native hardwood hardwoods. Uh, primary, primarily for market reasons or for eating, it's typically shiitake mushrooms. Those grow best on hardwoods. Uh, oak is great. They also work really well on some of the softer hardwoods. So things like sugar maple and black cherry. Um, sweet gum is another great one. Uh, but basically the process for growing mushrooms on the logs and what makes it great for some sort of a forest production or silviculture type management practice is you can be using what's left over after either a timber stand improvement cutting or a, a harvesting operation because what you're really after is some of the smaller diameter pieces. So some of the bigger branches, branches that are coming off of there that are, that are left in the slash af after a harvest operation. Uh, you're really looking for anywhere from about three and a half or four inches in diameter up to about seven or eight. Um, and then those logs would get cut down to a manageable size. There's really no rhyme or reason or, or ideal size as far as lengthwise. Um, most of them end up being about three and a half foot, so about 40 inches. Uh, that just makes them big enough where you're not having to do a lot of cutting, but still small enough where they don't weigh so much that you can still maneuver them. Um, when you're growing mushrooms on hardwood logs like this, the number one most important thing is that it's coming off of a tree that was living and healthy. If it's a dead branch or downed wood that's been down on the ground, um, it's almost guaranteed there's already some sort of fungus that's moved in and starting to grow. Um, and if you're trying to inoculate those logs, it's like sticking a tomato plant in the middle of your, your front lawn. It's just going to be completely outcompeted by the native fungi. Um, so it needs to be from freshly cut wood. There's a lot of 
information out on the internet about how exactly to do it, but the basic process is most of the time the, the logs are cut and ideally they're cut during the dormant season. Um, it doesn't have to be. The main time you want to avoid is in spring during sap flow. During sap flow, the bark is real loose on the logs and it can slip off uh, a lot, a lot more easily if, if the logs are knocked around um, and you need intact bark on that log, that bark's gonna help hold in moisture in the log and it's gonna also protect the, the interior wood from other competing fungi. Um, so dormant season is best, um, but it's not necessary. Fall works, middle of summer works, it's not quite as well, um, but years and years ago, we really started our big push for growing mushrooms uh, about the same year as the 2008 uh, derecho that hit. And I went around picking up logs all over in town in Carbonale because everybody had trees down and they were just piling stuff up. And it was a bunch of free wood for me to grow mushrooms on. So I went and it all worked really well. Um, it was May, so it was, trees were leafed out. It was past sap flow. So I wasn't too worried about that. Um, Basically you have your, your freshly cut log. Ideally you'd let it rest for two to four weeks. Um, when the trees are alive, they create antifungal compounds because they're alive. They don't wanna be infected by, by fungus and parasites and things. So they produce these antifungal compounds. It's not going to kill anything. So you can, and I have done in the past where I've cut logs and inoculated them on the same day it's not enough to kill the inoculum that you're putting into the logs, um, but it's just gonna kind of sit. So if you have the opportunity, once your logs are cut, keep them in a shady spot up off the ground on pallets or something like that, and let them rest for two or three weeks. Um, that's about as ideal as you can get. And then depending on what type of inoculum you're using, uh, you'll drill different size holes in those logs. Um, there's two main types of um, inoculum you can use. One is plug spawn, and that's basically just a small piece of dowel rod. Uh, usually they're made out of birch that's been soaked in water to hydrate and then has the fungus growing on them. And you drill a hole and you hammer the, that piece of dowel rod in. It's easy, it's fast. Um, but it's a little more expensive compared to sawdust. So the sawdust spawn would be a bag of sawdust that has the fungus growing on it. That usually requires uh, a special inoculating tool, which isn't expensive. They can be bought online for anywhere from 20 to $30. But basically that is a small uh, plunger that you can fill up with the sawdust. And then it has um, a spring loaded palm point on it that then pushes a plunger through and pushes that, basically what ends up being a small plug of that sawdust spawn into the hole. Um, either, either With either method, they both work. The sawdust spawn is a little less expensive and um, it takes off a little bit faster. Um, but once you've inoculated the logs like that, um, typically use hot wax. Uh, some people use beeswax. I always use cheese wax because it was readily available and inexpensive but you get the, wa the wax really, really hot and you put a little wax over that. That helps seal that up, that inoculation point up. It keeps the sawdust or the plug spawn from drying up and it also protects it from insects, um, especially with the sawdust. Insects will love burrowing in there and eating the mycelium, burrowing out the sawdust and then you lose your inoculation points. Um, a quick thing about the inoculating, Typically what you're doing, and this can be found a lot on, there's a lot of YouTube videos out on how to inoculate logs, but you wanna do it on a grid pattern. So if you, if you think about a log that you have standing straight up and down, you're drilling holes about every four inches along the grain up and down with that log. And then you're spacing those rows out about two inches and you're kind of alternating your path your uh, holes so that you're creating kind of a grid shape around uh, the log. That allows the fungus to grow uh, as quickly as possible with as few inoculation points as possible. Uh, if you think about the way the grain in that log is running, it's running 
uh, lengthwise with the log, it's much easier for the mycelium for the fungus to grow with the grain than it is to grow against the grain. And that's so you, why you can have four inches within the rows, but then you want the rows spaced about two inches apart. Um, once the, the logs are inoculated, you wanna keep them outdoors. They need to be able to get rained on. In our climate, the only time I ever had to water logs at this stage during this, the year that they will be vegetative growing, uh, which is typically uh, called the, the lay yard or the spawn run, um, it takes about a year. The only time I've ever had to water in that case was during the, the really bad drought. I think it was in 2011 or 2012 when we were having 110 degree days and we went months and months without rain. Um, otherwise, our climate is ideal for mushrooms. We'll, you'll get plenty of water. The logs will stay uh, uh, at, the, at the correct moisture content in the wood. Um, you just want to keep them up off the ground on a pallet or other logs or two by fours or cinder blocks, just something so that they're not making ground contact. That ground contact is just a pathway for other fungus to get in. Um, as long as they're off the ground in a shady spot, you'll be good. Uh, with shiitakes, most of the time it's going to take about a year for them to grow through that log before you'll start getting mushrooms. Um, some of the other mushrooms like oyster mushrooms, which you would ideally be growing on something on a softer hardwood, things like tulip poplar or willow, or uh, again, some of the maples. Um, those might only take six months. Um, but for the case of shiitakes, you're looking at a solid year. You might get some mushrooms a little bit quicker especially if you're growing them on maple. Uh, but if you're growing on, on a real dense hardwood like oak or hickory or uh, even sweet gum, it's gonna take a solid year before you start getting good flushes. Um, and then you kind of just let mother nature do the thing. There are methods to force fruiting where you soak the logs um, and that can get a little more in depth uh, but for the most part, most people just let mother nature do its thing. There are different strains. So some mushroom, some of them that'll fruit when the weather's colder, some that'll fruit when it's a hotter in the summer and some that are kind of wide range and do it just when there's real big uh, fluctuations in temperature and moisture conditions. Um, when we were growing primarily on logs, what I like to do is after that first year, we would run a piece of bamboo or even some wire between some T-posts or something just a couple feet up off the ground. And then we'd lay those logs up kind of crisscross up against them. Uh, they don't have to be like that, but that just makes more of the log surface uh, easy to access for when the, when the shiitakes or, or oysters or whatever you're growing start growing off of, off of the mushroom, off of the logs. Um, if you have them laying on the ground, a lot of times you get them grown from the underside they get more dirt and leaves and, and whatnot on them. Uh, and by stacking them up that way, you just have more access to them. They're, they tend to be cleaner. Um, most of the fruitings will be in the transitional periods of spring and fall. During mild winters, you'll get crops in the middle of winter too. They really like when you get warmer days, cold nights, and nice humid and wet weather. Um, that big fluctuation in temperature is a big trigger for the mushrooms. Uh, let's them know, hey, things are changing. Let's, let's grow. Um, but uh, yeah, other than that, um, the biggest thing I would say is to just start. You don't need many logs to get started if you're wanting to do it, especially if you're just trying to do it for yourself. Even five logs, um, you have a small understory that needs to be cleared out, clear out a, a, a small sugar maple or an overcrowded oak, cut it down, cut it up into five or six logs and uh, get yourself some plug spawn and, and uh, get started. It's a fun, fun way. Uh, you just have to be careful because it will snowball. Um, my hobby has turned into a full-time career, <laughs> but uh, yeah, have fun. And it's a great way to use up some of that, what otherwise might just be going for firewood or just laying in your woods, especially if you're, if you have some sort of forest management practices going on or a timber harvest happening. Uh, it's a great way to use up some of the, the upper parts of the tree. Um, I'm reading some of the comments here. 
uh, a question about concern about negative health effects from the consumption of products. I'm not sure what exactly that's referring to. Every, my understanding is about all the mushrooms other than rare occasions of allergies, just like somebody might be allergic to strawberries or milk or peanuts. Um, there's typically not many interactions or negative health effects from mushrooms. They're for the most part, as long as they're edible varieties that are being cultivated, most of them are very healthy, very safe for folks. Um, you know, a, really a, a, a good food source. They taste great. They're loaded with protein and minerals. They're fat free unless you're frying them in butter. Um, but uh, yeah, they're really good. If you have a, a follow up on that, I'm happy to happy to answer that. Another one of where do we sell them? Um, at this point, we sell our mushrooms all over central and southern Illinois. Uh, we started here just in southern Illinois at the Carbondale Farmers Market. Uh, we sell at the co-op in Carbondale, Fresh Foods at Carbondale. We sell to several restaurants um, around town in southern Illinois, places like Tom's Place in DeSoto, uh, the Underground Public House in Carbondale. Um, we sell through an online farmer's market called Leaf Food Hub. Uh, we work with other farms also who have CSA, so community supported agriculture, where they're selling so weekly subscriptions of their produce. A lot of these farms now add on other products like our mushrooms, or they'll add on beef from a beef farmer, or pork, uh, things like that. Um, and then we also sell a lot up in central Illinois in the Champaign Urbana area. Um, we, we go up there every week for their farmers markets. We sell to several stores up there. Um, we work with a distributor out of Benton, Illinois, uh, that then gets our mushrooms to a lot of restaurants uh, in the St. Louis and Southeast Missouri area. Um, so we're kind of, at this point, we're kind of all over the place. Um, with our indoor production, we're, we grow about five or 600 pounds of, of different mushrooms each week. I'm looking at another question. When you grow them in the house, how is it different? Um, so when you're growing mushrooms indoors, the process is extremely different. Um, so what we're doing when we grow our mushrooms, we're make, basically making an artificial log. So we're taking hardwood sawdust and we're mixing it with things like wheat bran or soybean holes, which add more lignin, a little bit new, more nutrition, basically a, a supercharged superfood artificial log. Um, but by doing that, we're giving a lot of food for any competing bacteria or fungi as well. So that bag of sawdust then has to be completely sterilized. So we make about 2000 pounds each week of this mix and we bag it up and it goes into a big stainless steel steamer and we steam sterilize it, uh, get it really, really hot, basically cook it uh, with that steam until it's sterilized. We've killed off any microorganisms in that. And then we take it into my laboratory. And I have a lab with the laminar flow hood. So great big HEPA filter that's blowing clean air. Uh, and we inoculate in there. Um, under those sort of circumstances, the first fungi in wins. Um, and so we're working in sterile conditions so that nothing gets into that bag except the fungi I want to get in there. Um, any little mold spore or bacterial endospore that gets in there is going to find an extremely rich, nutritive uh, habitat to grow and it'll proliferate like crazy. Um, so everything we're doing for growing indoors is under extremely strict controlled environment. When you're growing outdoors, there's a lot more leeway in mother nature. By drilling the holes in the logs, um, you're creating inoculation points so that what you're inoculating, say it's shiitake, then can grow and outcompete any um, competitors. Um, by doing that, you're, a lot of times you'll still get a few other mushrooms growing here and there, especially things like turkey tail, um, because they're really prolific in Southern Illinois. Um, but you're really just, you're stocking the odds in your favor by inoculating. But that's why it's really important when you're outside to inoculate fresh trees and to have them up off the ground so you can give your fungus uh, the best chance. Uh, I have a question, where do you get your spawn? Uh, so I used to buy spawn on the internet uh, the last eight or so years. Uh, now I make everything. So with the laboratory I have now, um, 
everything I grow starts as pure isolated culture. So in the lab, I have test tubes and Petri dishes with isolated cultures growing on them. We don't grow from spore anymore unless we're trying to breed a new variety. Um, so basically everything is a clone of itself. So um, for the most part, all of the shiitakes that I'm growing are the same genetic individual. Um, but so I, I make it, I also, I can make, uh, I make plug spawn most of the time just in the fall and winter and as well as the sawdust spawn if anybody's interested feel free, but there's also tons of companies out there on the internet. There's fungi perfecti. Um, we used to buy a lot from field and forest products, um, but I would try to stick with somebody that's well-known or more well-known um, company. If you're looking to buy spawn, there's a lot of folks selling it online and they don't have proper lab setups and you're kind of 50, 50 up in the air. If you're buying something that's actually clean and going to work well for you. Uh, another question uh, about somebody that went to a mushroom festival for kits. Uh, the, the mushroom kits can work. Um, there's a lot of places to get those as well. Uh, occasionally we'll sell those at farmer's market. Um, when I do it, it's, it's just the same bags that we're taking to uh, into our fruiting room and would be growing for our commercial production. Um, you know, it depends. I, I didn't buy one, but it seemed like the bag of sawdust with holes in it and the mushrooms. Yeah. So what that would be is the sterilized substrate that's then been inoculated and then has been grown through and it's ready to fruit. And so the, the holes in there is the way to get the mushrooms to fruit. Um, so when we're growing most of the mushrooms, we put a big X in the side of the, the bag that allows the mycelium that's growing on the sawdust inside uh, to be exposed to more air, the humid environment for growing mushrooms. And that lets them know it's time to fruit. That gives them a place to fruit out of the bag. Um, it's one of the, one of the, the light and oxygen are, are key triggers for the mushrooms to grow. And that's why if you see those kits, they have holes in them. They need that oxygen. Mushrooms, fungi are just like us. They consume oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. And when you're putting the hole in there, you're exposing them to an oxygen rich environment. It's just like uh, if a mushroom was growing out in nature, it's time to start growing. Uh, it's reach the edge of the log and it all of a sudden now it's no longer kind of half buried in the ground or underneath the bark it's more exposed to fresh air and light and the, and the humidity and it lets it know hey it's time to start growing mushrooms um, another question about light requirements or lack thereof mushrooms do need light um, they're not photosynthetic like plants so they're not using the light to produce energy, but they're phototropic. So light is a trigger for them. Um, just like the oxygen for them to start growing, light is another trigger for them. So if you all with pretty much all but your typical button mushrooms, there's a big misconception. You know, people see us at farmer's market and ask, oh, you grow these in a cave? No, it's a, a barn and we have quite a bit of light because that light is a trigger for them to fruit properly. Um, if you think about the way mushrooms, uh, if, take for example, morels are growing out of the ground in the spring. When they're covered up with leaves and things, they're gonna keep stretching um, until they reach an opening that gives them light and then they'll start growing up. Uh, that light is, uh, is a major trigger for them. They don't need a whole lot of light, basically indirect light. Um, if you can comfortably read, it's typically a, a, enough light for them. Um, with indoor cultivation, you get into other things with specific spectrums and, and lumens of how much light to produce the best colors because we grow a wide variety. Some of our mushroom, you know, some, especially the oyster mushrooms, some of them are blue, some of them are brown, some are pink, some are gold and yellow. Um, and the specific light requirements can affect the color to a degree. Um, but for the most part, if you can read comfortably, they're, they're getting enough light. Ready. Um, a really wonderful conversation and love the questions. Unfortunately, we're really pressed for time, um, Mike. 
So right. I hate to I hate to cut you off because I really like these these uh, these questions. I really want to like this conversation a ton, um, but that's my job to be the timekeeper here. So um, want to thank you so much for um, spending your time here. Really, really great information. I'm sure um, we may get more questions about this, and I'd say if you do, you can send those questions to me or Zach, and we can get them over to you if people have more questions. Yeah, forward them on. Always happy to talk mushrooms. Awesome. Great. Thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. All right. Um, we need to move right on to our next presentations, folks. So, uh, I, know, I know on your um, agenda, we had Danny Allstad as the next presenter, but now actually he is unable to make it. So, Stan Curtis from Carbondale Veneer has kindly agreed to step in and be our presenter for the next topic. Um, so Stan, I'm just going to open it up to you and let you introduce yourself and um, take it away from here. Thanks, Chris. Uh, my name is Stan Curtis, and um, I have 40 years of experience as a procurement forester, basically is what I, what I do. Uh, the last 31 years, I started a company 31 years ago called Carbondale Veneer Company. And basically I buy a forest product, standing timber and logs from forest landowners, uh, mostly private landowners, some state and federal agencies and some corporate landowners like the uh, uh, railroads own some timber land, the coal mines obviously own some timber land. So, um, so after 40 years, I've seen a lot of market changes and that's what Chris and Zach have asked me to talk about today is the market demands, the current current market prices. Um, in my 40 years, I want to say that I've seen about uh, four recessions where prices uh, dip fairly low and gets to a point sometimes where sawmills are not even, or local sawmills are not even able to sell any lumber. Uh, if the housing markets slow down, manufacturing slows down, that's where basically all the hardwood stuff goes. So uh, to bring you up to date to where we are now, I will tell you that if we go back to January of this year, before the virus showed up, we were in the most robust market that I've seen in 40 years in terms of demand and in terms of uh, the pricing, everything was the best I have ever seen. So uh, in, in March, when the virus became widespread and well known, obviously there was a lot of uh, of concern about where the markets were going, what the economy was going to be doing, and things did slow down for a few months at the beginning of this year. So, um, and then as some of the uh, markets began to change financially and interest rates started to go down, that was a big boost for the hardwood markets. Uh, housing starts now, be, at the beginning of the year, we were expecting over a million housing starts in the US and that's primarily what drives the hardwood business in our area because we're typically oak hickory forest, hard, hard maple, poplar, uh, cherry and those are all those woods go into commercial starts, housing starts in the forms of furniture, flooring, cabinets, molding and trim, all those nice things that go into the home. So whenever the housing starts are good, then our hardwood markets are gonna be good. So. Uh, after we kind of got over the initial shock of the virus, uh, and then interest rates started to go down and, and people were feeling a little, a little bit of confidence. They started to borrow, um, started to, to purchase new homes, remodel new homes and housing starts. Now we're expecting to be, uh, possibly 1.5 million before the end of the year. So that is driving the hardwood markets again. And it's, our pricing has gone back up, even though we had a little, a little dip in the early, uh, at the end of the first quarter and a little bit into the second quarter this year, we're now back at levels that we saw uh, back in January, which is the best I've seen in 40 years. So the demand is good. I, I, interest rates are gonna stay low and that's gonna continue to drive um, the markets and the prices. I, I think we'll I expect them to stay high for, for some time now, so. Um, people always want to know what, what are the prices and, and that's, uh, you can go to the DNR website and, and go to their forestry page. The, the DNR actually does a timber price survey 
every six months. So you can see the individual pricing on species per board foot. Uh, you can see across the board, there's a line item there for average prices paid for bottomland timber, uh, which is primarily uh, soft maple, sycamore, uh, sweet gum. And there's a line item for upland hardwoods, which is what most of us have here in Southern Illinois. Most of my business is with the upland hardwood, which is the old kickery hard maple market. So you can, you can kind of see where those are at. You can look back, you can scroll through those uh, DNR um, surveys and you can kind of see the up and down trends. Uh, but as far as getting, you know, pricing and what is, people want to know what is my woods worth? What are my trees worth? You really need to see a, a forestry consultant or a timber buyer to get, you know, some individual pricing because they're, I've, I've worked with over 900 landowners in the last 40 years, and I can tell you that no two woods are alike. So uh, the only way to, to uh, get an appraisal is to have somebody come out and do a walkthrough with you. And, and there are plenty of people in, I'm sure whatever area you're in in the state, there are people available to do that. Um, right now, um, you know, people, if they ask me what uh, about pricing, I always tell them, and we, we always talk in terms of board feet, thousand board feet, which sometimes is kind of confusing, but uh, I will tell landowners usually when they call me that if you have mature timber, that's anything that is ready to be harvested, it will probably be at least a minimum of five, five, six, seven hundred dollars stumpage value to you, the landowner. And then the prices just go up from there, depending on uh, the size of your trees, the volumes per acre, the species mix. Obviously, the, the highest right now uh, price timber is the white oak and the walnut. So if you have upland hardwoods uh, that has veneer quality white oak, the price just keeps going up per acre. Um, if you have uh, tributaries that run through your property with a little bit of bottom land where you maybe have some walnuts and uh, walnuts and is a very, very well priced right now. So those two things drive the prices higher than uh, in any of the other species. So, but it's best just to get, uh, get an, a, an appraisal from either a consulting force or, or an Illinois licensed timber buyer. Now, all licensed timber buyers are on the DNR website also. And there's, uh, I think, over 400 of us in the state of Illinois. So we're licensed and bonded by the, by the state. You can see that list. You can see the, uh, the people that are in your area. So um, uh, selling, if you're, if you're thinking about selling timber, uh, fortunately, you know, the timber is not a perishable product like Mike's, uh, like Mike's mushrooms or the corn or soybeans. So you can kind of look at the markets and, and, um, and your timber, you know, you wanna, wanna price it and think about selling when the economy is good. And that's, that's always, we follow the economy. Uh, if you look at us on the graph, as far as the timber prices go, when the economy is going good, uh, lumber prices are, are typically right behind that. So, um, Question from uh, Robin, a market like for black locust, would a portable sawmill be able to process it? Black locust, Robin, I don't currently have a market for black locust, to be honest with you. We don't see a lot of it in Southern Illinois. Uh, there are patches of it, but it doesn't typically get that big. Most of the black locusts that I do come across, I end up selling it to some local portable sawmill people. So you wanna, uh, yeah, portable sawmills, can handle it. It's a uh, it's a hard wood, but uh, it is soluble, and uh, it's great for you know those projects where you want to uh, have ground contact with with uh, lumber or post. So uh, that's a good question. And and lumber uh, black locust pretty much grows all over the state. So, um, it's Stan, I had a question. Yeah. Um, and I get this question a lot from landowners. And I wonder if you could address it. It's people yeah. that have small acreages, so they don't have a yeah. lot of timber to sell. Is there um, some minimum size or minimum number of trees you think that somebody needs to have to actually make money from a sale? 
that's a good question because I get calls all the time from from landowners with small tracts of timber. They may only have a couple of acres. They may only have ten to twenty merchantable sized trees. So, uh, and I always tell them, you know, the minimum uh, is basically for me as a buyer. It depends on what what your trees are. If you had ten mature white oak trees that were high quality and had good size, I would certainly be interested in coming to take a look at them. But if you had 10 soft maple or 10 sycamore who, who have low value, because you got to remember the cost for us to move equipment and to cut trees and haul trees, those costs are the same whether or not we're harvesting trees that are worth 10 cents a foot or worth a dollar a foot. So it's all about the economics when it comes to the size. And so it, it depends just basically on what species are there, or the quality of those species. And, and I, I can tell you that I've gone to projects that were less than five acres uh, and we probably cut less than 30 or 40 trees. So that's very doable. What I tell landowners most of the time, Chris, is if you have that small acreage and you can't get anybody interested, you need to keep your eye open for uh, loggers in your area because a lot of times if somebody is, uh, has a logging job going on down the road, maybe just a mile or two, uh, whereas they, they wouldn't bring all their equipment from an area, another a different area to do your little project. If they can drive their equipment right down the blacktop uh, and do a one day project at your property, then, then that's the best chance you have for getting those small parcels harvested. And there are a lot of landowners with very small parcels. Yes. Thanks a lot. Um, Go yeah, ahead and look at those well, questions there. Yeah. A couple more questions and then I'll surrender to our next speaker. Uh, cherry logs grown in Northern Illinois considered good or poor quality. Northern Illinois has better quality cherry and better quality walnut. Now the high quality cherry is typically grown in Pennsylvania and New York. Uh, but the Northern Illinois cherry is good and it is a lot better than the Southern Illinois cherry as is the walnut. It's just because of the climate shorter growing season. So the growth rings are closer together. Uh, there's less bird peck, uh, sapwood is, is thinner. So all those, all those things make a difference. And even in Southern Illinois from county to, and which I typically work from interstate 64 South, just from county to county, there's big variances of the quality of timber. So, uh, and from definitely from North to South in this state, it's a long state and it's a, species that we have down here they don't even grow in northern uh, Illinois and, and vice versa so it, it's a different ball game up there so and uh, I see my time's up I, I see there's some more questions and I'll, I'll try to um, we started you a little late Stan so I think yeah. we're okay running a little longer just yeah. because um, you were five ten minutes late it's getting started so okay feel free to address some of these questions I'll, I'll do a couple more real quick blow down trees um, Actually, yeah, I do, I do see some landowners around here that have the, if they have the ability to get them out of the woods and get them to the roadside, or actually if you can get them up on a small trailer and take them to one of the local mills, most of the local mills will buy those. Uh, number of my white oaks are dead or close to death, any value. We have a couple of scenarios going on in Illinois with a, a white oak uh, death syndrome, and we are losing a lot of white oak, particularly on dry, south facing slopes so I'm, I'm not surprised i'm not sure where this call is coming from but uh typically on any dead tree gary if you get it in the first year it still has some value uh after that first year the sapwood is going to rot so you're going to you're going to lose that and then that first full season that summer season the bugs are going to find it and once the bugs start to get in there and start to eat it you lose your value real quick uh, so another question from Robin, can I get someone to pay me for two black walnut trees? They are huge. Robin, that, that totally depends on the quality. And most of the time when I get that call, someone has two large walnut trees in their yard. And we just typically don't buy yard trees. They're usually short bodied. We don't know what's been nailed into them over the years. And people in my industry just kind of shy away from that. Now, if you have big, two big walnut trees, down in your woods that are high quality trees, you should contact somebody in your, uh, in your area to come take a look at them, absolutely. And typically when I say larger trees, I'm talking about trees that are 20 inches in diameter and bigger. 
So if you can go out there and, and bear hug your tree and your fingers don't touch on the backside, or if you can take a tape measure and pull it around and it's about 60, 65 inches or bigger in circumference, then you have some trees that you should be considering uh, marketable at that time. Yep. Anything else, Chris? Uh, just one more. We have time for one more comment here, Stan. I get okay. this question a lot, and I know it's kind of outside of your area, but I figure I got you, so I'm going to ask it. I'm thinking about this one. Um, okay. Would be um, pine markets for pines. Is there any yes. kind of market for people that have pines here? When you, when you move it, I, I'm on a project actually two, right now. Three, that, four to make it 3.56. Hold on, somebody. Which would be. There you go. Sorry about that, Stan. We have a, I have a project right now that, that the landowner has some pine trees that were planted back, I think, probably in the 60s. I believe they're probably at least 60 years old. They're, they're loblolly. They're, a lot of them are, are 20 to 26 inches DBH, and they're tall. And I'm looking for a market for them. And I'm, I'm not finding really much of anything. There's a few people that want them, but there's no no value to them. So I'm, I'm not even sure we're going to be able to do anything with them. We used to have a couple of big sawmills down here before the Shawnee National Forest uh, timber sale program uh, got slowed down. And now those pine sawmills are gone. And there's a few local uh, small sawmill guys that can take some, but most of them are not looking for any any quantity of, of pine. So um, I know one of the markets right now is an uh, for us locally as a company over in Missouri that grinds it for horse bedding. So you can imagine how low value that, that product is and the cost of getting it over there is just uh, uh, makes it a non-starter. So uh, unfortunately, uh, I can't say anything very positive about pine markets right now. That's all right. It's good to know that answer for sure. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, that's all we have time for. I'm sure we could just sit here all day and talk this. Um, really good information. We appreciate your expertise and you spending the time with us. Uh, sure. This is really good. And uh, if anybody has any questions, want to contact me, I'm at cvenier at gmail.com or they can call my office at 618-549-5495. Thanks, Chris. Great. Thank you so much.